in the year 1714. At the age of 11, John Wesley was placed at the Charterhouse School in London. That mighty plunge in life, a boy's first entrance at a public school, seems to have done him no harm. He had probably been well grounded at his father's house in all the rudiments of a classical education and soon became distinguished for his diligence and progress at school. At the age of 16, his elder brother, then an usher at Westminster, describes him as a brave boy, learning Hebrew as fast as he can. In the year 1720, at the age of 17, John Wesley went up to Oxford as an undergraduate, having been elected to Christ Church. Little is known of the first three or four years of his university life, except that he was steady, studious, and remarkable for his classical knowledge and genius for composition. It is evident, however, that he made the best use of his time at college, and picked up as much as he could in a day when honorary class lists were unknown, and incitements to study were very few. Like most great divines, he found the advantage of university education all his life long. Men might dislike his theology, but they could never say that he was a fool, and had no right to be heard. In the beginning of 1725, at the age of 22, he seems to have gone through much exercise of mind as to the choice of a profession. Naturally enough, he thought of taking orders, but was somewhat daunted by serious reflection on the solemnity of the step. This very reflection, however, appears to have been most useful to him, and to have produced in his mind deeper thoughts about God, his soul and religion generally, than he had ever entertained before. He began to study divinity, and to go through a regular course of reading for the ministry. He had, probably, no very trustworthy guide in his choice of religious literature at this period. The books which apparently had the greatest influence on him were Jeremy Taylor's Holy Living and Dying, and Thomas a Kempis imitation of Christ. Devout and well-meaning as these authors are, they certainly were not likely to give him very clear views of scriptural Christianity, or very cheerful and happy views of Christ's service. In short, though they did him good by making him feel that true religion was a serious business, and a concern of the heart, they evidently left him in much darkness and perplexity. At this stage of John's life, his correspondence with his father and mother is peculiarly interesting and highly creditable both to the parents and the son. He evidently opened his mind to them and told them all his mental and spiritual difficulties. His letters and their replies are well worth reading. They all show more or less absence of spiritual light and clear views of the gospel but a singular vein of honesty and conscientiousness runs throughout. One feels, this is just the spirit that God will bless. This is the single eye to which will be given more light. Let us hear what his father says about the question, which is the best commentary on the Bible? I answer, the Bible itself. For the several paraphrases and translations of it in the polyglot, compared with the original and with one another, are, in my opinion, to an honest, devout, industrious and humble man, infinitely preferable to any comment I ever saw. Let us hear what his mother says on the point of taking holy orders. The alteration of your temper has occasioned me much speculation. I, who am apt to be sanguine, hope it may proceed from the operation of God's Holy Spirit, that by taking off your relish for earthly enjoyments, he may prepare and dispose your mind for a more serious and close application to things of a more sublime and spiritual nature. If it be so, happy are you if you cherish those dispositions, and now in good earnest resolve to make religion the business of your life. For, after all, that is the one thing that, that strictly speaking, is necessary. All things besides are comparatively little to the purposes of life. 
I heartily wish you would now enter upon a strict examination of yourself, that you may know whether you have a reasonable hope of salvation by Christ. If you have the satisfaction of knowing, it will abundantly reward your pains. If you had not, you will find a more reasonable occasion for tears than can be met with in a tragedy. This matter deserves great consideration by all, but especially by those designed for the ministry, who ought above all things to make their own calling and election sure, lest, after they have preached to others, they themselves should be cast away. Let us hear what his mother says about Thomas a Kempis' opinion, that all mirth or pleasure is useless, if not sinful. She observes, I take Kempis to have been an honest, weak man, that had more zeal than knowledge, by his condemning all mirth or pleasure as sinful or useless, in opposition to so many direct and plain texts of Scripture. Would you judge of the lawfulness or unlawfulness of pleasures, of the innocence or malignity of actions? Take this rule. Whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes off the relish of spiritual things, in short, whatever increases the strength and authority of your body over your mind, that thing is sin to you, however innocent it may be in itself. Let us hear what John Wesley himself says in a letter on the opinion of Jeremy Taylor. Whether God has forgiven us or no, we know not. Therefore, let us be sorrowful for ever having sinned. He remarks, Surely the graces of the Holy Ghost are not of so little force as that we cannot perceive whether we have them or not. If we dwell in Christ and Christ in us, which he will not do unless we be regenerate, certainly we must be sensible of it. If we never can have any certainty of being in a state of salvation, Good reason is it that every moment should be spent, not in joy, but in fear and trembling, and then, undoubtedly, in this life we are of all men most miserable. God deliver us from such a fearful expectation as this. Correspondence of this style could hardly fail to do good to a young man in John Wesley's frame of mind. It led him, no doubt, to closer study of the Scriptures, deeper self-examination, and more fervent prayer. Whatever scruples he may have had in whatever scruples he may have had were finally removed, and he was at length ordained deacon on September the nineteenth, seventeen twenty five, by Dr. Potter, then Bishop of Oxford, and afterwards Archbishop of Canterbury. In the year seventeen twenty six, John Wesley was elected Fellow of Lincoln College. After a contest of more than ordinary severity. His recently adopted seriousness of deportment and general religiousness were used as a handle against him by his adversaries, but his high character carried him triumphantly through all opposition to the great delight of his father. Tried as he apparently was at the time in his temporal circumstances, he wrote, "'Whatever will be my own fate before the summer is over, God knows,' But wherever I am, my Jack is fellow of Lincoln. The eight years following John Wesley's election to his fellowship of Lincoln, from 1726 to 1734, form a remarkable epoch in his life, and certainly gave a tone and colour to all his future history. During the whole of these years he was resident at Oxford, and for some time at any rate acted as tutor and lecturer in his college. Gradually, however... He seems to have laid himself out more and more to try to do good to others, and latterly was entirely taken up with it. His mode of action was in the highest degree simple and unpretending. Assisted by his brother Charles, then a student of Christ Church, he gathered a small society of like-minded young men in order to spend some evenings in a week together in the study of the Greek Testament. This was in November 1729. The members of this society were at first four in number, namely John Wesley, Charles Wesley, Mr Morgan of Christchurch and Mr Kirkman of Merton. 
At a somewhat later period, they were joined by Mr Ingham of Queen's, Mr Broughton of Exeter, Mr Clayton of Brasenose, the famous George Whitfield of Pembroke, and the well-known James Hervey of Lincoln. This little band of witnesses, as might reasonably have been expected, soon began to think of doing good to others as well as getting good themselves. In the summer of 1730 they began to visit prisoners in the castle and poor people in the town, to send neglected children to school, to give temporal aid to the sick and needy, and to distribute Bibles and prayer books among those who had not got them. 